We're going to look at how to unlock the oxygen in your brain and your body by using breath based on available science and data. We all face physical and mental challenges every day. What if we do not have enough oxygen in our brain? We may have memory loss or memory impairment. We may have learning disability. We may have brain fog. We may feel agitated. We may feel anger. We may feel fatigued. We're going to look at a case study from one of my clients. He's a male, 34 years old, uh, computer science grad from a uni. Uh, he, he's been working in the IT field for the last 10 years. Uh, he works at about six days a week. Uh, he's, he lost about 50 pounds in the last couple of years. Um, his vital stats, his blood pressure is actually quite good. Uh, so is his pulse and his SpO2, they're all within the range of normal. His symptoms for the last 15 years or so is quite challenging. Um, he has headache, um, brain fog, uh, vision issue, hearing issue, uh, also generalized fatigue. Um, sometimes the symptoms that go so severe, uh, in, for instance, with, with the headaches and the vision and the brain fog, that he has to get off the road while he's driving and wait till the episode subsides. Uh, when he goes to shop at the supermarket, sometimes he gets this piercing chest pain that he has to drop everything and cannot complete his shopping and has to go home. Uh, he has to get up about four times a night to go to the bathroom. Um, he also cannot concentrate on conversation for more than a couple of minutes. Uh, he gets agitated and angry. Let us now look at my client's medical journey. He has been to see a family physician and the family physician had referred him to see a sleep doctor and the sleep doctor had ordered a sleep study and the diagnosis came out to be uh, he has mild sleep apnea and he was offered a uh, CPAP machine. He was also referred to see a neurologist and the neurologist had ordered an MRI scan and the MRI scan turned out to be within the range of normal. There was no abnormality. At this point in time, my client felt that the medical profession has no solution for him, that he was left up to his, on his own. We all face physical and mental challenges every day. We all like to have more oxygen in our brain, in our body to perform better. When we measure the oxygen level in our body by using pulse oximeter, let's say it reads 96 to 98%, what it means is that the 96 to 98% of the oxygen is actually bound to the hemoglobin. And the release of the oxygen from the hemoglobin is depending on a number of factors. And one of them is carbon dioxide. The low level of carbon dioxide reduces the delivery of oxygen to the brain cells and to the cells of the rest of the body. It does so by one, causing vasoconstriction, uh, thereby reducing the blood flow to the brain cells and to the cells of the rest of the body. In this 2003 studies, it shows that the low level of carbon dioxide causes 35% reduction in the blood flow to the brain and 10% reduction in the blood volume. The second is that the low level of carbon dioxide causes the oxygen dissociation curve to shift to the left side, thereby making hemoglobin less likely to give up the oxygen. And both these effects are summarized in a 2002 paper. Carbon dioxide is measured in partial pressure. The unit is millimeter mercury. The normal range is from 35 to 45 millimeter mercury. Anything less than 35 millimeter mercury is considered to be uh, low carbon dioxide level. You cannot measure the level of carbon dioxide in your body the way you would measure oxygen using a pulse oximeter. You need to use a capnometer or a capno trainer to capture the level of carbon dioxide at the end of the exhale in your breath. This is a study that 2012 study that supports the use of capnometer or capno trainer to capture the level of carbon dioxide. You may have low level of carbon dioxide because the 
one and two breathing or right in one and two breathing. Uh, for example, when you have an anxiety moment, what happens is that you may breathe faster, deeper, harder. You may breathe through your chest versus the diaphragm. Um, you may have some breath hole. Let's look at what a normal allow breath looks like versus a control breath. Um, on this captogram, you'll see this is a long, normal, regular breath. You'll see that there are four breaths and they're all of the same consistency. And in other words, they have the same inhale timing, exhale transition time. On the other hand, if you look at this control breath, you will see all the breath of uh, different size shapes. Uh, if you look at it, they have some of them will have aborted inhale, exhale. Uh, you also notice that the, the carbon dioxide level is also less than 30 millimeter of mercury. Control breathing involves chest breathing. With chest breathing, the carbon dioxide level will remain low. Um, it is important to be able to tell the difference between chest versus diaphragm breathing. Uh, the capnometer or the capno trainer will actually help to quantify the difference between uh, chest versus diaphragm breathing. We can measure the level of carbon dioxide with different breathing mechanics using capnometer or capno trainer. Uh, in this first case, we're looking at control versus allow. In, in the control breathing, we can see the carbon dioxide level is at about 30 millimeter mercury. When we switch over to allowing, uh, the carbon dioxide level rises to about 35 millimeter mercury. In the second instance, we have diaphragm breathing, which is uh, carbon dioxide level is about 35 millimeter mercury. When we switch over to chest, we can see it drop down to about 30 millimeter mercury. And in the last situation, last case here, we're looking at nasal versus mouth breathing. Definitely nasal breathing maintain a much higher carbon dioxide level than mouth breathing. Let's talk about my client that we talked about at the beginning of session. Let's look at his data first, and then we'll look at the symptoms. But as far as data is concerned, we can see that he has tremendous improvement with the level of carbon dioxide. At the beginning, he was hardly able to reach 35 millimeter mercury. Now he can consistently go 35 and even go to 40 millimeter mercury. Um, not only that, we also have data on his uh, heart beat to beat heart rate, which is really a reflection of what we call an HRV. Uh, if you look at the initial heart rate, you can see that he was hovering around somewhere between 70 and 80. Uh, there's consistency in terms of that. And if you look at the data after several learning sessions, his heart rate came down to be about around 60. Let's compare his symptoms before and after several learning sessions. These are the listing of it, but we're going to go through a little bit. Um, once we are able to reach the carbon dioxide level of 35 millimeter mercury, he no longer has headache, brain fog, uh, vision impairment, hearing impairment. He could go for a long walk, up to two and a half hours, which he did last time, uh, without getting fatigued. Previously, he could only do it for, for about five minutes. In those two and a half hours, he could actually carry on a conversation without being angry and agitated, which he was not able to do previously. Uh, he no longer needs to get up to go to the bathroom at night time, which he used to do four times a night. Uh, he can go to the shopping mall and without, without actually feeling the piercing chest pain that he used to experience before. And he was telling me that his mind is so clear now that he could do the job of three people at his uh, IT project. What we looked at today in this video is that how the low level of carbon dioxide causes the reduction of oxygen supply or delivery to the brain cells and to the rest of the body and the associated symptoms uh, with it. Uh, we also looked at what causes, partly we looked at what causes uh, you to have, let's see, a low level of carbon dioxide and we talked about controlled breathing. Controlled breathing is only one of them. So in the future videos, we're going to be discussing about more detail about controlled breathing and other type of breathing. And so please do subscribe and comment below to receive future videos. Uh, getting back to what causes you to have a controlled breathing is really anxiety. So the anxiety comes in the form of, for example, cognition in terms of the past history. It could be a trauma in your past history. It could be a present event, for example, somebody cutting you off right on the highway. Uh, how would you react? 
or could be future thoughts about the future, could be jobs, work, marriage, whatever it may be. So those all has an effect on the anxiety and the anxiety will change the way you breathe. At this time, I'd like to thank everyone for the patience in going through the science segment. And uh, please do uh, subscribe for future videos. Thank you.